I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for Facebook to catch up, and then I'll be on both YouTube and Facebook once Facebook catches up. But right now we're on YouTube for just a few seconds, and I'll be making an announcement here pretty quick. Sorry about the delay, but can't get them both to come on at once. Good evening. I'm Dr. George Westlake Jr. from Sheffield Family Life Center in Kansas City, Missouri, and this is Living Answers for Today. I'm here tonight to answer questions about the Word of God, to help with problems that you might be facing in the Christian life, and if you don't know Jesus Christ, to let you know that he himself is the answer to the complex problems you face today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he cares about you as if you're the only person that ever existed. I've told congregations for many years and had them repeat the phrase, God loves me as if I'm the only person he ever had to love. Then I have them repeat, I'm as important to God as any person who has ever lived. And thirdly, I have them repeat, if I'd have been the only one that sinned, Jesus would have died just for me. And that is the absolute truth of the gospel. He loves you that much. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, he's knocking at the door of your heart tonight if you don't know him to let him know that he can forgive your sin, to let you know that he can forgive your sin if you receive him as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says as many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. Religion's dead. Jesus Christ is alive and well, and he's knocking at the door of your heart tonight. If you're a Christian, I remind you that he said, I will never leave you, nor not know, never forsake you. Five negatives in one sentence in the original in Hebrews chapter 13. He won't leave you. He's there in the middle of the difficulty that people are going through today, regardless of what it is. He's there to take us through. And again, I remind you of the scripture I've been quoting recently every week, and the Lord keeps nudging me to do it again. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by your name and your mind. When you walk through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they won't overflow you. When you pass through the fire, you will not be burned, and neither will the flame kindle upon you. He said there'd be fire, there'd be water, but he would be there to take you through. I remind you, it was not until fire, until Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, went into the fiery furnace that Jesus appeared walking with them. He let them go into the fiery furnace first, and then he was there to sustain them. Isaiah said, when the enemy comes in like the flood, literally from the midst of the flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift the standard up against him. And he's actually picturing a man walking across the desert of Judea. And when they get a heavy rain, the ground does not absorb it. And our guide told me they've seen a bus knocked off the road because of the onrush of the water in a heavy rain. And Isaiah pictures someone walking through that desert being hit by the flood. When they're about to go down for the third time, the spirit of the Lord lifts a standard up against him when the enemy comes in like the flood. And so he, he's there with you in the middle of the storm tonight. And this is a time for you as a Christian to encourage other people and to let them know that God cares. Invite them to go to your church with you. And by the way, don't stay away. You know, one of the warnings of the book of Hebrews is stop forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and that much more as you see the day approaching. One of the habits that's hardest to get back in is going back to church when we've been missing. And that's why the Bible gives us that warning in the book of Hebrews. If at all possible, try to get back to your church this weekend and take someone with you. If you want your church to grow, again, 90% of anyone that ever receives Jesus Christ is because a friend invites them to go to church. So let me encourage you to invite someone to go to your church. Be faithful to your church during this difficult time because your church still has ministries going on. And I know your pastor and the board appreciate your faithfulness during this difficult time, as do the pastor of our church. My son is the pastor of our church now. I've been that same church for 47 years. And I was senior pastor for 33 and then pastor emeritus for the past 14. I turned 89 a couple of weeks ago. And I still have the privilege of teaching every Wednesday night. And I preach a lot of Sundays at other churches. And I thank God as long as he keeps me healthy and halfway sane. I sometimes question the sane part, I tell people. But as long as God keeps me that way, I want to keep proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a lot of questions. And we had a lot sent in because we only went half an hour last week because of the presidential debate. And I've been out of the city, but we had 35 more come in just today. And actually, my daughter sent them to me today. She does all that paperwork for me. And so we have 35 questions. And while we're live on the air, you can, 
Uh, you can put a question in the comment section on Facebook. You can post it there, and it'll be copied down and handed to me while we're on the air because I can't look at the screen and look at the microphone at the same time. And so it will be handed to me, so don't hesitate to put your live questions in, and they will be inserted between the other ones. I may run over the hour and a half tonight. I'm going to try to get through as many of these questions as I can and yet want to answer them accurately. When the Bible talks about the angel of the Lord, is it a pre-incarnate of Jesus? Yes, it is. And actually, the word angelos in the New Testament, translated angel, is actually means messenger. The same is true of Moloch in the Old Testament, means messenger. So, so the context has to determine whether it's truly what we call an angel or whether it's a messenger of God. And I think the translation, the angel of the Lord, should be translated the messenger of God. Why? Because Jesus is not an angel. He's never been an angel. He created the angels. We are told that in the book of Colossians. It says he is the firstborn. And by the way, that means preeminent. He is the firstborn of every created thing. Why? For by him were the all things created. And about 700 years before the birth of Christ, the Roman uh, the Greek poet Homer, uh, he wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad. He came up with the Greek phrase, ta panta, that is literally translated, the all things. And it means everything that exists. And Paul picks up on that phrase in Colossians. For by him were the all things, ta panta, created, that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones, dominions, rulerships, or authorities, he's talking about angels, both fallen and good angels there. The all things were created by him and for him. He is before the all things, and in him the all things hold together. And it goes on to say it pleased the Father that he should be preeminent over everything. And that's the meaning of firstborn. I remind you, First Chronicles chapter 5 teaches us that actually that Jacob made his son Joseph, who was the 11th, the firstborn. My, he is the preeminent one. And you can read about that in the book in the book of First Chronicles chapter 5. He, okay, he made his 11th son the firstborn. Firstborn is the preeminent, okay? So, so actually, the angel of the Lord is always Jesus, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. Recall at the burning bush, it says, the angel of YHWH, which is God's name translated Jehovah, uh, in the King James Bible, no, okay, but, but also in the Hebrew is YHWH, and he goes on to say, the angel of YHWH called the Moses out of the burning bush and says, the Lord said. Why? Because the angel of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate form, many pre-incarnate appearances in the Old Testament. He appeared to Abraham as a man and said, I'm going to come on Sarah, and Sarah's going to have a child. Angels cannot reproduce. They're spirits. They appear as men, but they're not men. They only appear as men because they're spirits. They're called ministering spirits in the book of Hebrews. So, okay. So, yes, it, it's always a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. What is the sea of the dead in the book of Revelation? Well, actually, it's not called the sea of the dead. It just talks about it, the great white throne judgment after the millennium. It, it says the sea gave up the dead which were in them, and death and Hades delivered up the dead that were in them. So it's just saying that everyone that has died for any cause will be resurrected and stand there before the judgment seat of God. That's a great white throne judgment. Now, Christians will, will have already been judged at the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is for rewards. If you're a Christian, your sin was judged on the cross of Calvary. Jesus bore your sin. As Isaiah said 700 years before his birth, he is wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. With his stripes we have been healed. And so Jesus paid the bill. We stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which I believe takes place the moment you step into eternity, and that's for rewards, what we have done for the kingdom of God. The judgment seat at the end of the millennium, the great white throne judgment is for the ungodly. That's why death and Hades will deliver up the dead that were in them. Death, you know, death is personified as a place or a person, and it's not. Death and Hades, anyone that's died, whether it be in the sea or whatever, they're going to be resurrected and stand before God. 
And so it does, it's not really called the sea of the dead. It just means those that have died in the sea, as well as every other kind of death, will be resurrected. He's just trying to make it all inclusive, that it doesn't matter how they died, they're still going to be resurrected. What is the tablet theory of Genesis? Well, actually, in the, in the 1830s, Wissett came out with the idea that you know, Moses probably wrote the Pentateuch and he found a bunch of tablets or were delivered to him a bunch of tablets from the time of Abraham on explaining all the things that have happened and Moses just summarized it. Well, that's not true. There's no basis for that whatsoever. You know, the Holy Spirit inspired the word of God and part of the scripture is revelation. Now, revelation is when God reveals something that someone couldn't know. Moses could not have known about the seven days of creation. He could not have known that. God had to reveal that to him and about a lot of the other things. And all scripture is inspired by God. It's exactly what God wanted in his word. That's why Paul tells Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, which means literally God breathed and is profitable for teaching, for correction, for, in righteousness, you know, and so on because we might know how to live. Again, the Bible's not given to fill our head with information. It's given to tell us how to live. Practical, everyday living. It's the most practical book ever written. It tells us how to live 24 hours a day, a life pleasing to God when we have the Holy Spirit within us and we're able to do it. We can't do it on our own. When we receive Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside and enables us to live as we can't live by ourselves. So that's the tablet theory of Genesis. Of Genesis, it came out in the uh, in the 1930s. Okay, but, but then I have something else I want to mention. It's also what's called the uh, it's also called the synoptic problem of the Bible. And the general ideas is actually taught by liberals to begin with. It's actually called form theology. And they claim that Mark wrote his gospel first, and that's the voice of Peter, which most people believe. You know, Peter's the voice, the eyewitness behind the gospel of Mark. Mark is the scribe. And then oh, and all the other gospels use Mark as an outline. And it's basically called form theology because they're repeating some of the things, especially Matthew and Luke. However, a lady by the name of Etta Lindemann, uh, she was a form theologian, a liberal, and she met the Lord and started really studying the scripture. And she wrote a magnificent book. And this is for the pastor's information called There is Not a Synoptic Problem. And she looks at all the various hypotheses of form theology that try to take away inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the truth of the gospel and shows that it, the gospel is absolutely accurate and form theology has no place that the inspiring word uh, they also believed it was what called a Q document. They had the Gospel of Mark and the Q document, and from Q they wrote the other Gospels. She pointed out very strongly there has never been discovered a Q document. There is none. There's no need of it because Jesus said the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance old things you've heard from me. And so the Holy Spirit moved on people to write exactly what God wanted in each of the four Gospels. So there was no need of a Q document. The Holy Spirit is the Q document. And I'd said that to a lot of people before I read her book. And it was an, it's an amazing book. Okay, an amazing book. If you're involved in form theology or if you're, if you're in discussion with someone that believes it, get Etta Lineman. It's Etta Lineman. Okay, I think it's spelled L-I-N-N-E-M-A-N. That's close to it. And she wrote the book, There Is Not a Synoptic Problem. And it said it's a magnificent book to read. You know, when you read through the Gospels, there's only one place after the opening of Christ's life, the beginning of his ministry, until you get to the end week, there's only one event recorded in all four Gospels. Only one event that's in all four of the Gospels in the middle of Jesus' ministry. That's the feeding of the 5,000. Now, why the feeding of the 5,000? John's Gospel explains that they came to make him king. They said, hey, here's the Messiah. Let's march on Jerusalem and drive the Romans out. And he sent the apostles across the sea. And as I mentioned many times, the biggest storm was in their life, not the, not the wind that was opposed to the boat, because they had confessed he's the Messiah. He's the Christ, the son of the living God. Here was his opportunity to march on Jerusalem with the people behind him, and he turned it down. 
But, but, but the reason it's all four Gospels is that's the turning point in the ministry of Jesus. Before that, he was primarily teaching the multitudes. Now he primarily turns to the 12. He still teaches the multitudes, but he's primarily teaching the 12 who are going to be carrying his gospel. And the feeding of the 5,000 is the turning point. That's why it's in all four Gospels. It is the only major event recorded in all four Gospels from the beginning of Jesus' ministry till you get to the last week. That's the only place they come together is the feeding of the 5,000. Okay? And I, and I had another question in connection with that. That's why I answered that way. Why doesn't John in his gospel give one single parable of Jesus? Because he knew the other three gospels were already written. And his purpose, he's writing to Christians. And he knows they already have access to the other gospels. And John says, you know, he calls the seven, he has the seven I am's. You know of Jesus in the gospel, and then he also said many other signs did Jesus, which are not, not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and believing you might have life through his name. Now, he uses the word for the seven miracles he picks out, he uses the word semeon, which is a sign. A sign is a miracle showing a spiritual truth. For instance, when he fed the 5,000, he was teaching, he is the bread of life. And the people misunderstood what he was trying to get across. That's what he said. You didn't come because you understood the sign. You came because your stomachs were full. Okay, I fed 5,000 men beside women and children. And so, and because they didn't understand it, he turned primarily to the apostles after that. But that's why he didn't bother giving a parable. That's not what he's trying to show. Uh, he knew they had access to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That was the last gospel written. And he's written to demonstrate that Jesus is the Christ and what it means to have abundant life. Okay, abundant life. The seven miracles are signs, say meon. The other word for miracle comes from dunamis, dunameos, which is a power. That's the usual word for miracle. And then there's tarata that is translated miracle. That's something that causes, wow, did you see that? It's called a, uh, it's actually called a wonder in the Bible. Wow, did you see what happened there? Okay, but, but the word John uses is a semeon for the sign, the life. I'm going to start teaching on the Gospel of John in a couple of weeks on Wednesday nights. Uh, right now I'm starting Second Peter tomorrow night at sflc.net. That stands for Sheffield Family Life Center.net. And we're on from 7 to 8.30 on Wednesday nights. And then the teachings are still on the website. You can go to, the, you can go to sflc.net and go down bottom to the and down the bottom, they have an arrow for YouTube, and you can go to that, that and there on there, too. Is public confession necessary for salvation, as stated in Romans 10, 9, and 10? If you will confess your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, if you will confess the Lord Jesus, okay, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. in your heart and confess with your mouth. And it actually... Uh, there are several translations. The New American Standard says, confess Jesus as Lord. And actually, when you read the Greek text, you will confess Lord Jesus, meaning you're speaking that he is now your Lord. Okay, the custom in that day for the Romans was to say, kurios Caesar, Lord Caesar. They said, no, kurios Jesus, Lord Jesus. And so it's confess Jesus as your Lord, I think is the best translation, which is in the New American Standard. Or just confess Lord Jesus, meaning he has become your Lord. I may want to simply say out loud, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Okay? I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And that's, you know, that's the way I lead people in the prayer, to actually receive Jesus Christ. Again, 1 John describing the word believe, not 1 John. John chapter 1 in his gospel, as many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God, even to those that believe in his name. So he defines believing and receiving as the same thing. Because the basic word translated believe is actually translated receive some places in the New Testament. And the best test of belief is action. I believe this chair I'm sitting in would hold me. That's why I said in it. That's what belief is. Belief changes your life. It affects the outcome. And so when you receive Jesus Christ, it affects your outcome in every way. It affects your life in every way possible. Okay, the New American Standard Bible is an extremely accurate translation. Okay. 
That's what I tell people to get for a good study Bible. If you want a good study Bible, get the New American Standard. Now, actually, the, the English Standard Version, which is a revision of the old Revised Standard Version. Now, the old Revised Standard Version was not a good translation, but they've improved it a whole lot, and I'd say 10 million percent in the English Standard Version. And it's a very good translation. Now, a translation is word for word of what it says in the uh, in the scripture. One word for one word. Once in a while, you have to use two. And what a lot of the translations are are practically what you call dynamic equivalent. And what the translators did, they looked at the original language and then used their own words to express that. So they're not literally a translation. Okay, the translations of the King James. The New King James is very good, by the way. The New King James is very good. The New American Standard and the English Standard are word-for-word -word translations, okay? Word-for-word -word translations, not putting it in somebody else's wording. And the only problem with putting in your own wording, sometimes your, your theology can influence how you do something. And that's why I recommend a word-for-word -word translation for serious Bible study. Why did Jesus tell the rich young ruler he could be saved by obeying the commandments? Well, you have to look at the whole story. So let's look at Mark chapter 10. Let's look at Mark chapter 10. It's also recorded in Matthew's gospel. Luke mentions it. Okay, Mark chapter 10. And I'm going to have a little bit of trouble reading tonight because my eyes have been bothering me. Okay, I picked up some kind of infection in my right eye while I was out of town. Just got back in this morning from Dallas. And it was actually hurting before I left here. But we read in Mark chapter 10, beginning with the 17th verse. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came running unto him and kneeling to him and said, Good teacher, what must I do that I might inherit eternal life? In other words, what good can I do to inherit eternal life? What good thing? And the other translation says, What good thing can I do, the other gospel, that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why do you call me good? There is none good but one, that's God. I mean, he wasn't denying the fact that he was God. If you're only recognizing me as a teacher, don't call me good. I remind you, part of the fruit of the Spirit is goodness, okay? If you read Galatians 5, part of the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. It's only in accordance with the character of God. What we call goodness, it's not necessarily what the Bible calls goodness, okay? But, but he said... I said unto him, you know the commandments, okay? And he said, which? He said, okay, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, okay, do not defraud. Now, he substitutes covet for that. In the original, in the Old Testament said, do not covet. Jesus used defraud here, okay, and honor your father and your mother. And the young man said, all these have I kept from my youth up. What am I lacking yet? He knew I was lacking something. Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said, okay, will you think lacked? Okay, now. He said, I want you to take all that you have and sell it and give it to the poor and take up your cross and have me... Take up your cross and follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. What was going on? When Jesus quoted the commandments, he only quoted the last six that have to do with re our relationship with other people. In other words, loving your neighbor as yourself. What was lacking in his life? The first four that have to do with our relationship with God. And as you read the story, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. What was happening? Jesus never told any other man, any other person, the whole Bible to do that. Why? This young man's money was his God. So he said, if you're going to be perfect, you got to get rid of your God and you've got to follow me. You've got to follow me. I'm the way to God. And so the young man went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now there's a great teaching here in connection with this. And Jesus Look round about and said unto him, how difficult it is for the rich to inherit the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished. They said, who can be saved? Well, it sounded like some people today. Well, if you got faith, you're going to be rich. If you're a good person, you're going to be rich. Then why does the Bible say the poor are rich in faith in the book of James? Okay. 
Now, but they had that same idea. And Jesus said, hey, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, some of you heard that the eye of a needle was a gate in Jerusalem that a camel really had to scrunch down to get through. No, because they said, who can be saved? And he said, with man, this is impossible. So he was talking about an impossible situation. And by the way, the fact that there was a gate in Jerusalem called the eye of a needle that was inaugurated in the 11th century AD by a man by the name of Theophylact. He invented that hypothesis. There was no such gate. And, and whatever it was, he said a camel could squeeze through it. Well, what Jesus said, he said, with men, this is impossible. So he was not describing a gate that some camel could just barely get through. He was describing an impossible situation. What would it be to put a rope through the eye of a darning needle? No, he said, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible, meaning God can put the camel through the eye of the needle. Now, it's going to be hard on the camel, but God can do that. God can do the impossible. So he indicated it's very difficult for those that have riches to, to, to be saved. Well, they put their trust in their riches. They can buy what they want. They can do what they want. All right. So they don't have the problems that most people have. And so it's very difficult for many of them. That's why a lot of people that could be rich aren't rich because God knows they'd put that ahead of him. They'd always be gone away. They'd never be in church. They'd never be at home. They'd be taking vacations all the time or they'd... I like the phrase, spend till it ends, buy till you die. Okay, spend till it ends, shop till you drop, spend till it ends, and buy till you dry. That's what a lot of people would do if they were rich. And so God can't trust a lot of people with that. Now, I, I know most of us think we could be trusted with more than we have. But, you know, God meets our need, and that's the main thing. So that's why he told the rich young ruler he was dealing with the fact that his money was his God. He never told anyone else to sell what you have and give to the poor. Just that one man, the only man. <laughs> I've never been able to read the entire Bible. What would you recommend as the best way to do this? Reading it chronologically from Genesis to Revelation can seem a little overwhelming at times. Yeah, some people can read it that way, and some people it doesn't work well for them. And I suggest maybe reading like Genesis and Exodus and then going and reading maybe Matthew and Mark, or go to the New Testament. Okay, then go back and read Leviticus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then go back and read the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John. And then go back and read Joshua and Judges and maybe First Kings and Second Kings. And then go and read, you know, the Book of Acts and read maybe Romans and Galatians. Jump back and forth between the old and new, but I do recommend going through the Old Testament in chronological order, okay, in the way they're written. Now, they're not always in the order they happen, but you, you can read it in chronological order so you don't lose track. And then go back and read part of the New Testament, then go back and read part of the Old. Now, if you're just starting to read the Bible for the first time, I recommend reading the whole New Testament through before you start on the Old Testament. Read the Gospel through a couple of times, then go to the book of Acts and the letters, and then possibly the book of Revelation, then go back and start in the Old Testament. Okay, but read the New Testament through a couple times before you get to the Old Testament. Because the adage I've explained several times on this program is that the New, every truth in the New Testament is found in the Old Testament, but the Old Testament is explained by the New Testament. And the phrase I heard many years ago was that the New is in the Old contained, but the Old is by the New explained. So the New Testament throws light on a lot of the truths in the Old Testament, such as Isaiah 53, 700 years before his birth, wounded for our transgressions. Unless you go to the New Testament, you don't understand what it's all about. The old is by the new explained. Some people reverse it. Some people reverse it and try to explain the new by the old, and they come up with all kinds of strange teaching. Okay. So that's the way I do it. That's the way I do it. But whatever works best for you, there's no pattern that's correct or incorrect. No pattern correct or incorrect. Okay, let me see what this is. Uh, the restrainer who keeps the Antichrist at bay, the Holy Spirit. If so, if he leaves at the rapture, will be saved during the tribulation. It is not the Holy Spirit. 
The Bible says in him we live and move and have our being, okay? There's nowhere you can go that the Holy Spirit is not. That's why the psalmist said, if I make my nest among the stars, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. And he's not trying about trying to run from God. He's talking about the fact that no matter where he is, God is there. In him we live and move and have our being, we're told in the New Testament. So who is the restrainer? The restrainer is the Holy Spirit in the church. The last message of the Bible, Revelation 22, the spirit and the bride say come. It's the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ that is a restrainer, proclaiming the gospel in this world, announcing the good news of Jesus Christ, okay? There is a witness, there is a light shining in the middle of this darkness, and we need to let our light shine as never before. We need to be more vocal than we've ever been. Stop being so concerned about being politically correct and be biblically correct. Not to go people with a yam 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 attitude, but to let them know no matter what they've done, no matter where they've been, that God loves them and he can change their life and set them free and make it better and have a relationship with him and have everlasting life in the presence of God. It's not what the customer comes in for. It's what he goes out with that counts. I say, I don't care why people get saved as long as they get saved. If they get saved to escape hell, if they get saved so they can go to heaven, if they get saved to have a better marriage, if they get saved to stop a habit, it doesn't matter. The main thing is they meet Jesus Christ and then things start to change in all of their life. That's the main thing. So the restrainer is the Holy Spirit in the church. You are the salt of the earth. Salt is antiseptic. I mentioned the statement once saying it's septic, and I had a doctor corrupt me. No, it's antiseptic. Okay, it stops the spread of poison. And you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. Jesus said, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world, but I'm going away, and now you're the light of this world. As long as that light is shining, okay? But the Holy Spirit will still be here. He seals the 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel. The Holy Spirit is the seal. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 1, the 14th verse, after you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit within us is the seal. We know we're headed for heaven because we have the seal on the inside. Okay, We know we're citizens of heaven. We know that we belong to Jesus Christ. We have the seal, and the seal is the Holy Spirit. And we read in Revelation 7, the white robe multitude, when John is asked by the angel, who is this? And he says, you know. He says, these are those, it's a continuous action verb coming out of the great tribulation. It's a continuous action participle for the benefit of the pastors. It is a continuous action verb. People will be saved all during the great tribulation period. The first three and a half years because of the two witnesses. After that, there will still be people that know what happened. I'm one of those that believes the rapture will be one of the noisiest events in the history of the human race. Okay? But but they're probably going to attribute it to aliens or something like that. And that seems to be the direction we're headed. But but it will be a noisy, noisy worldwide event. Look how quick they shut the world down this time. Imagine if millions of people are missing and all the small children are gone and all the babies are gone. All right? Yeah, Jesus said, suffer the little children to me and stop forbidding them. So of such is the kingdom of God. They're part of the kingdom. Okay, so, okay. Uh, I don't know what prophecy you mean. What is your take on the Bere Sheath prophecy? Now, Bere Sheath is, is the opening chapter of Genesis, Bere Sheath Ra'alhim, in the beginning. Bere Sheath is in the beginning. So I don't know what the Bere Sheath prophecy is. You'd have to elucidate me a little more about that. Uh, I don't know what it's claiming. If it's a date setter, it's wrong. Okay, Jesus said when they asked about the date, and I've repeated this for the whole 47 years I've been in Kansas City, they asked Jesus about when he was going to restore the kingdom of Israel. He said, it's not for you to know the chronos nor the kairos. Chronos is how much time is going to pass. Kairos is the appointed time. It's not for you to know. In other words, he says, I'm coming as a thief. And even when Paul in Thessalonians talks about the rapture of the church, he says, now concerning the times and seasons, the same two Greek words, chronos and kairos, I'm not going to write unto you. Why? Well, he's going to be Lord's coming as a thief in the night. In other words, I'm not going to waste time trying to figure it out. He's coming as a thief. 
several times in the book of Revelation. He says, I'm coming as a thief. The day of the battle of Armageddon is going to be known. There's only two events that come as a thief in the night without any warning. One is the rapture of the church. The other one is the beginning of the seven-year period called the Great Tribulation or the Day of the Lord. They're simultaneous events, the rapture of the church and the beginning of the Day of the Lord. Okay? You're coming as a thief. So are you going to believe Jesus or are you going to believe the date setters? I don't know if that's a prophecy of some date setters or not. They've always come along and they always have to change their mind and say, well, it's going to help. I made a mistake by one year. Okay. And then they write another book, but you're going to believe Jesus or the date setters. And if that's the issue, we better believe Jesus. Okay. I mentioned many times on the program, the book 88 reasons why the rapture is going to take place in 88. And they sold thousands of copies, thousands here in Kansas city. I wouldn't let them be sold in our church. And, uh, I mean, after I found out about the book, I didn't even know about it. And they, they tell me this book is selling. They called me. I used to do a live TV program, as many of you know. I did for 24 years, Bible Questions and Answers Live. And people would call in the questions, and we'd talk live. And that doesn't work that well on, on this, but you can still send the questions in ahead of time. Or you can send them in live while we're on the air. But they, they asked, why aren't you announcing the rapture is going to take place on Rosh Hashanah? Said I wasn't aware that it was. They said, haven't you read the book? And I said, yeah, from Genesis to Revelation. Oh, no, the book. 88 Reasons Why the Rapture is going to take place in 1988 during Rosh Hashanah. And I hadn't read five pages before I wrote down five false assumptions in the book. The number one is Jesus said it's not for you to know. He's coming as a thief in the night. Read the parable of the thief, not knowing when he's coming. That's the whole issue. That's the whole issue. Now, it tells the Thessalonians after that that they won't come on you unaware. Why? Because you can see the times of the signs. You know it's getting near, but you don't know You don't know when. You don't know when, and it's not for you to know. I don't care if you've had dreams or visions. You don't interpret the Bible by dreams and visions. You interpret the Bible by study. You interpret your dream and your vision by the Bible to see if it's accurate, okay? And so... Uh, and I put a full page ad in the Kansas City Star the week before Rosh Hashanah. And I said, come after Rosh Hashanah and Pastor Wesley will explain why well-meaning Christians are deceived by false prophets. Okay. And this is the same thing today. Christians want to believe so badly. All right. But just don't believe everybody that comes along. Uh, in Isaiah, what are the differences between Hezekiah and Ahaz as kids? How does Hezekiah manage to save both Israel and his own life? How does he prove himself? Well, what happens in the case of Ahaz, and you can read it about the 7th or 8th chapter of the book of Isaiah, uh, he talked about the Assyrians coming down from the north, and, and, and Isaiah did, and he said, ask a sign from the Lord. Isaiah to tell Ahaz the king to ask for a sign. And he said, I'm not going to ask God to give a sign. So because he deliberately disobeyed God, okay, the, the, you know, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came down. He, they took all these, all, uh, that's, he took the northern kingdom of Israel. Then they came down against Jerusalem. Well, Hezekiah he took a stand against it, and he got a letter from Sennacherib saying, hey, none of the other kings have been able to stand against me. He opened, he took the letter and opened it in the temple before the Lord, and so God sent Isaiah to him, because you're trusting me, I'm going to deliver, and Sennacherib, uh, you know, he sent the Rab Shekah, his spokesman. And he came and he criticized the king and said, and he went on and had the people of Israel trembling. And Hosea went in before the Lord and Isaiah sent the message to him, because you believe God, that the God will protect Jerusalem. Okay, 60,000, no, it was 80,000 people in his army died that night. Now, the man ruled for 20 more years and never came near Jerusalem again. In his archives, he doesn't say what happened there, but he never came near Jerusalem again, okay? Never came near it. And uh, maybe it was 66,000. I, re I don't recall the exact number, but you can read it in the book of Isaiah, chapter 36, 37, 38, 39, 4, right there in the middle, okay? 
right there in the middle of the book of Isaiah, or you can read about it in Chronicles. But, uh, but but he took care of it. But but he, I mean, if God tells you to ask a sign, ask a sign. Okay, if God tells you to do something, do it. And Ahaz didn't want to do that. I'm not going to ask the Lord to give me a sign. Okay. Uh, can you please tell me your views on who can and who should take communion? Who can and should take to sit at the Lord's table? What does it mean unworthy to take the communion? Why shouldn't the communion? What, what, who shouldn't take the communion? Why do so many get this wrong? Because of a mistranslation in the King James Bible. And it has caused so much pain and so much hurt down through the years. And pastors, let me refer you to Gordon Fee's book on 1 Corinthians. It's the one I use for the textbook when I teach it at master's level. And it's such a magnificent book. But I but I did this for years, and I was glad to see Gordon Fee's book. I guess maybe that's why I like Gordon Fee so well. Because you know things I've been saying, he's considered one of the world's top scholars. But you read in 1 Corinthians, and you can't pull the scripture out of context. Now, I'll remind you, the problem in the Corinthian church was division, all right, division. And that was the main problem in the Corinthian church. The key verse is in chapter 8 when it says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And then he goes on to describe what's going on in the Corinthian church, okay? Now, let me turn over to chapter 11. Starting with verse 29. I've got verse 10. Starting with verse starting with verse 18, my eyes are playing tricks on me tonight. I mentioned I have an infection in one of my eyes, and uh, so I'm having trouble reading. First of all, when you come together in the church, you cannot eat the Lord's Supper. What? You can't eat the Lord's Supper. Why? For in eating, now this is the context. Every one of you takes before the other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunk. Don't you have houses to eat in and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame them that have not. Now, you got to see a background here. There's two different opinions when you look at the background. Number one, they had what they called a love feast. We would call it a potluck dinner. Everyone would bring food that could. Okay, they would eat, and they'd talk a little bit. They may have had a message, because don't forget, most churches were little house churches. And because they didn't have big churches to worship in when the church first started, they had house churches. That doesn't mean we need to go back to that, all right? But they had house churches. Um, and then they would cap it off by taking the communion service. Now, you can see what was from going on here. The poor people weren't getting any food to eat. I go out and I've got money, so I eat all my own food. And here my poor brother or sister part of the body of Christ is doing without food. Now, some people believe the wealthy people would come together first and they would eat. And they and Paul is telling them to wait until the poorer people got there. But it may be either way. In any event, the poor, poor people were not being taken care of. You notice all the way through the New Testament, you're told to help those that are poor. You're told to help those that are, are being mistreated. You're told to help those that are less off than you. Now the one he goes on, for I've received of the Lord that which also I deliver you. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he betrayed, he took bread. Now let me take, let me point something else out. The communion service takes the place of the Passover. Why would someone getting drunk? The Passover was a celebration. Remember Jack Hiles preached this, well, it wasn't Jack Hiles, Jack, uh, <laughs> It was Jack Hayford at the big church in California, preached a sermon years ago, celebrate the table of the Lord. And he pointed out that the Passover was a celebration. Why do you think people were getting drunk? It was a celebration. 
And if you read the Old Testament, the, the, the feasts were instituted for you and the strangers that are in your house, strangers that are in your land, the stranger too. You go to Israel today, if they're celebrating, they'll invite you some of them into their homes to share it with them. Okay, especially the Feast of Tabernacles. They'll invite you to the little tabernacles they've got set up. And so the, the Passover was for you and the strangers within your gates. Now, let me give you a little background before I go on. I got called years ago on the TV program. And the person said, if I'm coming to your church and you're having communion, I can't take it, can I? I said, of course you can. He said, what if I'm not a member of your church? I said, that doesn't matter. It's the Lord's table. He said, what if I'm not a Christian? And I said, it's the Lord's table. You're welcome to take it. Who would Jesus turn away from his table? He said, come unto me, you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden light, and you'll find rest for your souls. I had someone say, well, only the apostles were at the early supper. Why? Because that's all the people he had to take it. He, that was his intimate family. Now the, the whole world, he died for the sins of the world. But let's go on reading here. Let's go on reading. Now remember the background. The poor were doing without food, okay? Now, and when he had given thanks, he'd take it, break it, and said, take, eat. This is my body, which was broken for you. This do in remembrance. The Passover was a remembrance of what happened 1450 B.C., this is now the communion is a remembrance. There's no magical creative power in the communion service. All right. And at the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament of my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me. For all, if you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. It's an announcement. By the way, he didn't say how often to do it. Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord. Now, the King James says unworthily. Read any of the other translations. They say in an unworthy manner. What's the unworthy manner? I'm eating my food and I'm not giving the poor people any. Okay, it's not any personal worth or any personal holiness. Some people are so afraid, as Gordon Fee says, they're afraid to take something that's supposed to be of great spiritual benefit to them. I know the first church I pastored, a small country church, we had 54 people. Only four of them would take communion. They were so terrified in case they'd committed a sin over the past week or two. And I didn't have the background to tell them any different at the time. Okay. But I said, God encourages you to take it, to come to the Lord's table. But that's all I could do. I was only 23 years old when I was pastoring my first church, and I wasn't saved till I was 19. I spent two years in the Korean War, then came back at a year of Bible college, and then got voted in as the pastor of this little country church. We drove back and forth to college 70 miles. Okay. And drink of the cup in an unworthy manner. She'll be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Okay, let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. He that eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, what is the Lord's body? It is the church that's gathered at the table to share the communion service. As Gordon Fee points out, the body on the cross is never just referred to as the Lord's body when it's on the cross. It's always the body and blood, all right? Never. Now, discerning the Lord's body, looking around and seeing who has need, not discerning, not careful of my brother, not careful of my sister that has a need, all right? For this cause, many are sick among you and many sleep. And I heard David Lim, who pastored the Great Grace Assembly in Singapore, uh, so large, they have two huge campuses. He was he was also the president of a, of the Asian Theological Seminary for many years. Okay, the Asian Theological Seminary, and he made the statement he uh, uh, he thinks the reason so many were sick were because the Christians weren't taking care of each other. Okay, and Gordon Fee says this is not argument against it. He he said this is a statement of fact, just a statement of fact. 
For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged of the Lord. When we are chastened of the Lord, we should not. When we are chastened of the Lord, said we should not be condemned with the world. Now he doesn't end reading there, but most people do. Wherefore, my brothers, when you come together, carry one for another. In other words, make sure everybody gets food. And if you're that hungry, eat at home. All right, eat at home that you come not together into condemnation. The condemnation is not taking care of the needy. It's got nothing to do with, am I holy enough to take the communion of the Lord? He invites us to his table, the Passover celebration. He paid the bill for our sin on the cross of Calvary. He invites us to share as the body of Christ. And so much has been done to damage people through that. So much has been done. And we've, we've done that for years. And let me give you another story. And when I was senior pastor, when we had communion, okay, I didn't do it that often. But when we did, I actually built the whole service around the communion service. And I and when I got done preaching, before we had communion, I always, give an altar call, always gave an altar call. And I always do it to receive Jesus Christ personally. Okay. We have people come down, pray with them. Now stay in your seat because we're going to have communion after. You come down. Can we have prayer for those receiving Jesus Christ? And then go back and sit down. Now I'd say as this communion table is passed out, the Lord invites you to his table whether you know him or not. But if you've never received Jesus Christ as you're eating this bread, remember that his body was broken for you. As you're drinking this cup, the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood, and he poured out his sinless life for your sin on the cross of Calvary so God can forgive you for your past no matter what you've done. And as you eat this communion, why don't you receive Jesus Christ for the first time in your life? And again, I've given an altar call for salvation. People have come down. After the communion, I always asked, how many of you Receive Jesus Christ for the first time in your life, taking that communion. Hands go up all over the church. Now, our auditorium sees 3,000. Hands go up all over the church. There have been literally hundreds and hundreds of people saved taking the communion service. Taking the communion service. They met Jesus Christ. Then we have them come down after. Someone would like to pray with you after the service. If you feel you want to come down, let someone pray with you. But they received Jesus Christ taking the communion service. And this idea of I'm unworthy, of course you're not worthy. Who would, well, they said, while well, the apostles took it, were they worthy? Peter sure wasn't. He was about to go out and curse and swear and say he didn't know the Lord. And Judas certainly was not worthy. Okay, the Lord still gave him the communion. So, you know, we make issues of things. That one word in the King James Bible, unworthily. Okay, again, every other translation, an unworthy manner. Read the verses before. Read the verses after. Read the whole context of 1 Corinthians. Okay. I need some help with the problem. I can't seem to get rid of. There is an evil, foul, tormenting spirit in my house. I've been quoting Psalm 91 seven times a day. I walk around the house quoting the scripture. I open the door, play worship music, and say, get out. I used to praise and worship God. Why don't you now? No. Okay. I listen to scriptures and prayer at night when I'm asleep. I call on Jesus for help, and this spirit won't leave. What else should I do? The spirit caused my family and me heartache and pain. Are you sure it's a spirit and not just natural things that are happening to your family? Because number one, it sounds like your heart is right before God. You may get some other Christians to walk with you and to pray. And I know some people go around and anoint their house with oil. That, and, you know, oil won't keep a spirit out because the spirit's, <laughs> I mean, a spirit's a spirit. I know people go around and anoint their windows and doors while the spirit can come any other way. But the battleground might be taking place right here. That's where the battleground is. And the best way to fight that battleground is to focus your mind off what the enemy's telling you and focus your mind back on the word of God. Sounds to me like you're making a good effort. I'm going to ask people in your private prayers, would you pray for this person that God will give wisdom and maybe just send someone else to pray with you at that house, you know, and believe God, because it sounds like you're doing that. You command him to leave in the name of Jesus and command him not to come back. The Bible says, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. 
And the way I explain the difference between authority and power is an 18-wheeler can rumble down the street and shake your house, but a man comes out with a badge and goes like that. That's authority, and all that power comes to a screeching halt. And Jesus said, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. So you have to be able to sort what's happening naturally and what happening is happening is caused by the enemy. And I think sometimes we can play every event that happens to us as being caused by the enemy. Now, I've got an eye infection. I don't think the enemy necessarily caused that. I might have gotten near somebody that had one. I don't know. And uh, we don't know what happened, why I have an eye infection. And uh, it might be the enemy, but it might just be a natural cause. Uh, so we just need to pray and believe God for you and with you. It sounds to me like you're doing everything you can, but just command him to leave and not come back. And the enemy won't leave you alone. As long as he's bothering you this much, he's not going to leave you alone. So we have to learn to fight the battleground of the mind. That's the biggest battle. Paul says, oh, we don't walk in the flesh. We don't war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshy, but they're mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds, casting down that high thing that opposes itself to the knowledge of God, casting down imaginations, bringing every thought into the captivity of Christ. Well, how do we fight that? Paul tells Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of intimidation. If you only place the word used in the New Testament, a self-controlled mind. So we focus our mind off the lie of the enemy and focus our mind on the word of God. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. All right? And uh, the, 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 the truth of God and the, and the word of God. And it sounds like you're trying to do that by reading it, but you might have to take your mind off what the enemy's telling you and focus you on it. Okay, that might be the battle you have to fight. That's always the hardest battle. That's always the hardest part of the battle because we're human and we never stop being human. But we'll be praying for you, all right? I don't want to make this program a program of prayer, but I will pray for you after the program's over. I will and believe people that are watching to pray with you too. Okay, I got a couple more here. Why did God strike dead the person who tried to save the Ark of the Covenant from falling off the wagon? Wasn't he just trying to help? Well, the commandment of God was don't touch it. I mean, if God gives you a command, it doesn't care what your motive is. It, it, it was a flat disobeyment to what God said. And only the Levites could touch it. Okay. They were the only ones that could do it. It was their job to carry it. And God just... It, it's like I mentioned earlier, the Lord did, uh, Lord told King Ahaz, oh, I know through Isaiah, that I asked the Lord for a sign, and he said, I'm not going to do it. And God judged him because of disobedience. You know, God doesn't, we, we need to obey God. Okay, and that, I mean, that's why. Okay, that's why he was trying to help, but he was disobeying God. You don't touch that. Okay, you don't touch it. Uh, uh, how do you witness to someone who wants proof, not scriptures? Well, I wouldn't, I, I you know, I, I mean, I don't try to prove I exist. There's nowhere in the Bible that God tries to prove he exists, okay? God never tries to prove he exists. The proof is on their part to prove he doesn't, which you can't do. But I'd recommend some of Lee Strobel's books. Okay, the case for the creator, the case for the cross, the case for Jesus, the case for the Bible, some of the best apologetic books there are. And they're, they're very simply explained, okay, by Lee Strobel. Uh, the case for a creator is a very good one. I recommend that every college student, if you have a college student, get them the case for the creator. And the case for the Christ, the movie. Uh, uh, if you're not aware of Lee Strobel, his wife accepted the Lord. Uh, he was an investigative reporter, and he started out to disprove the resurrection because of his wife's faith. I mean, he talked to scientists and everybody else, and he ended up becoming a Christian because it's one of the best attested facts in all of history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And again, books by Lee Strobel. And God can use a book like that. I used to use a book called Evidence that Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. And there are many atheists to whom I gave a copy of that book and said, I dare you to pray this prayer. God, if you're real, if the Bible is your book and Jesus Christ is your son, 
Let me know that as I read this book. I say, I dare you to pray that prayer and read this book. I had atheists after atheists come back and say, I've accepted Jesus Christ. Person after person. Well, Lee Strobel's books are even better than that one. Lee Strobel's books are even better. And uh, we had a couple, one couple came in. I gave them the book. They were both atheists, husband and wife. Came back the next week. She said, I know it's true. I know it's true. He said, I don't. Well, he came back the next week and accepted the Lord. He said, I lied. I just didn't want to admit it. <laughs> because when he read the book, he, book, he believed it. And uh, some of the things that are presented and the truth of the gospel, you know, it's up to them to disprove it, which they can't do. <laughs> of course, you know, when you've met him, there isn't any doubt about it. And, uh, and I recommend the books by Lee Strobel. Do you believe it's okay to date or marry a person of another denomination or religion? Not another religion, another denomination. Yes, if they're saved and know the Lord. The issue comes down not to belong to a church. The issue comes down to you know Jesus Christ. A believer should not marry an unbeliever. Okay? A believer should not marry an unbeliever. I've refused to marry more than one couple over the years. I've refused to marry them. No, you're going to have to go somewhere else. I've refused to marry... A number of couples down through the years. Uh, one couple, they only knew each other for 10 days and wanted me to marry them. I said, no, you're not ready. And they got married. They were divorced within six months. And uh, so uh, b b b another denomination, yes, might be okay. It depends on the denomination. Uh, it's radically different than where you attend. You might have to do some you might have to do some visiting at the two churches and decide on one. You shouldn't go to separate churches after you're married. Okay, you need to decide on one for your family to attend. <laughs> okay, to bring your children into. But uh, the other denominations, all right, as long as they know they're saved and know Jesus Christ. But if you know Jesus Christ, you should not marry. You can be a church. I was a church member when I was 19, didn't know Jesus. I never knew I could have a personal relationship with him. Recited the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. Sang the doxology every Sunday. I was old enough to do it. My parents always took me to church. And my mother got saved at home after my dad walked out on us when I was a teenager. Okay, and she'd always been in church choirs. I started singing in a little, in a children's choir. I can remember singing as a, as a boy soprano in a choir. But I didn't know Jesus. But never told I could have a relationship with him. Just the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer and the doxology. And uh, the only thing I knew about Scripture, the pastor would read a short passage and tell me, tell me God had his blessing to the reading of his holy word. That's all I ever heard about it. And then when I met Jesus, wow, I came home and read this book every night. And I'd holler at my mother, hey, he walked on water. Hey, he took five loaves and two fishes and fed 5,000 men beside women and children. I, I, I'd come home and read the Bible, and a lot of mornings I was still there when it was time to go to work. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. I did it for about a year. When I got 19, and got drafted in the Army when I was 20. Had opportunity to witness to the Lord, started preaching in Korea during the Korean War. And, uh, you know, God just opened doors for me. But uh, does God ever change his mind? Well, from a viewpoint, he does. But he, he has foreknowledge. He knows what he's going to do ahead of time. But he does it for our purpose to show us. Uh, for instance, when Moses made intercession for the people, God's, I'm going to destroy them, make a nation out of you. He was developing something in Moses. Moses said, no, blot me out of your book first. He was developing that in Moses so he could be the kind of leader God wanted him to be. And so God, it looked like God changed his mind, but he knew what he was going to do anyway. God has foreknowledge. That's not necessarily predestination. Foreknowledge, God knows the decision you're going to make. And he'll put you in a position, hopefully, you know, where you make that decision. But he tried, but he gives everybody a choice. Remember, last message of the Bible, whosoever will. And it's even stronger in the Greek text. Whosoever wants to come and drink of the water of life freely. Whosoever wants to do it, come. And you say, well, God, we only get the want if God draws us. No, no. No, that's the theory of Augustine. Okay, God has to call you by irresistible grace. You have to come. You don't have a choice. There's no such teaching in Scripture. No such teaching in Scripture. God gives you the choice. Uh, one of the authors mentioned all of Augustine's friends. You're talking about the fourth century A.D. All of Augustine's all of Augustine's friends were Pelagian, 
and he was brave enough to start teaching predestination. You mean, you mean the first 300 years the church did not preach the truth until Augustine came along? No. The whole message of the Bible's choice all the way through. You have a choice. Okay. But from our viewpoint, it seems that God changes his mind. And here's another question kind of along the same line. The Lord's Prayer makes me think that God's will is not always done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But in James 4.15, it seems to say that his will is always done. No, James says this. If you're going into such and to such a town, you shouldn't say this is a Christian. I'm going to go on such and such a day and do this. You ought to say if God wills, I should do this. In other words, and actually what James is saying, you better check if you're a Christian on God's will for your life. Don't make a decision without asking God's will. God to be with you, God to preserve you, God to bless you, God to instruct you. If it's God's will, we will do this today or tomorrow. But God's will is not always done. The Bible says twice in the New Testament, God is not willing that one soul should perish, and yet people are going to perish. God wants everybody saved. God so loved the world. It doesn't say he just loved the elect. He loved the world that he gave his unique son. That whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever. Okay. Now, you. what the Bible teaches in the book of Ephesians is God has elected and predestined those that are in Christ. He has not determined who is going to be in Christ. That's our decision. But he has chosen and elected us in Christ. So when you choose Jesus Christ, you become one of God's chosen. When you choose Jesus Christ, you become one of God's elected. Read he, uh, read the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 14. It's one long sentence in the original. We are chosen in him before the foundation of the world. God chose, elected those that are in Christ to be his children. We have the choice whether we're in Christ or not. The whole message of the Bible is chose. Choose you this day who you will serve, said Joshua. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Again, the last message of the Bible, whosoever will come and drink of the water of life freely, whosoever will exercise his or her will, whosoever wants to, and Augustine tried to say you can't want to because you're born a dirty, rotten, filthy sinner. You can't want to serve God. Then why does the Bible say whosoever wants to? Well, he has, he has to give you that want to. Now, God works in our lives to direct us. He gives us the want to. The Bible says that. God works in us to want to and do of his good pleasure. But he's talking about us as Christians. For instance, when I first got saved, I wanted to preach. I thought everybody wanted to preach. But I thought I can't because I stammer so badly. Okay, except when I'm preaching and I stammer so badly and God gave me a promise that night when I stand behind the book to preach, I'd never do that. I do it teaching Bible studies. I do it some days I can't carry on a conversation, but never once in over 60 years behind the pulpit because God gave me a promise. But I thought everybody wanted to preach when they got saved. My pastor said, no, they don't. God was working in me to want to, but I thought I couldn't do it. So if, if you have a desire maybe to work with the youth, God might be giving you the want to. You don't know how to do it. Well, the youth leader will involve you and show you how and what you need to do. The same with children's ministry. If God's laying it on your heart to work with children, you go to the leader of that department or whatever church you go to, and they will let you know what's required to work along that line. Because God may be giving you a desire to work with that. And that's how God works frequently. He gives us the want to and the will. But he gives us a free will. He never violates our free will. Okay? Never violates our free will. So frequently, again, the New Testament says twice, God is not willing that one soul should perish. Both Paul and Peter say that. Pastor Westlake, please explain the soul and spirit distinction. I think you say we're made up of mind, body, soul, and spirit. I used to explain it to someone. I forgot how it goes. Well, the way I explain what a human being is, I draw a target. I have an outside circle, a second circle, and an inner circle. Oh, 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 okay, the, uh, the outside circle is the body. We live in a tent called the body. It says in Genesis 1, God breathed in the man's nostrils the breath of lives, and man became a living soul. Paul talks about believing to the salvation of your soul, okay? 
The soul is the real you. I'm a soul. You are a soul. We live in a tent called the body. So the outward circle of the target is the body. Then the second circle inside is the soul, the real you. The only way my soul can communicate with your soul is through the body. Sight, touch, hearing, taste, voice, smell, feeling. The only way is through the body. The only way we can truly communicate. The soul can communicate through the body. That's the next circle. The inner circle is the spirit. We have a spirit. The spirit is that by which we communicate with spiritual beings. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God, okay? We have a spirit. Now, when you die, the soul spirit cannot be separated. The book of Hebrews indicates only the word of God can cut between soul and spirit. So the real you will always have a spirit on the inside with you, your spirit. We now have the Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit. Now, right at the center, I draw another little circle connecting the mind. Uh, it's actually collecting the soul and the spirit together. A little circle just connecting the two circles together. The outward circle, the body, then the soul, then the spirit, and a little dot of a circle in the middle called the heart or the mind. It's a Hebrew word, lave. It's spelled L-E-B as in boy. However, it's, spelt, it's actually spelt like L-A-V as in Victor, lave. Every translation of the Bible into English translates that sometimes as heart and sometimes as mind. Because frequently when God deals with us, it works through our mind. So you can't separate the soul and the spirit and the mind from each other. The mind kind of connects the soul and spirit together. Because God speaks, the way God speaks to me is like a thought envelops me, but I feel the witness of the spirit within that this is God. That's the way God speaks to me. Now he speaks, number one, time alone with God. Don't be so busy working for God, you don't take time with God. That can happen to a lot of people. So busy, so busy for God. That time alone with God, there is no substitute for that. I mentioned before I had the privilege of spending several hours with Cho Young Yi. Most of you know him as Young Yi Cho, the best, largest church in the history of Christianity in Seoul, Korea. And I was able to have about two or three hours of his time by myself one day. And he mentioned that he spends three to four hours a day in prayer, and 90% of it is listening, not talking. 90% of it is hearing what God has to say. No wonder God enabled him to build the biggest church in the history of Christianity, okay? And God has blessed his ministry down, down all those years. It's a great joy to full gospel church, okay, in Korea. And it's a magnificent, magnificent ministry and, and magnificent man of God. And uh, I was a lot younger than I am now, maybe not a lot younger. It was a few years ago when I was there. But that's what I've done most of my prayer life is listening. You know, I, I, I talk to God, but I try to hear mostly what he says. I learned a long time ago that I don't know what I'm doing, but he knows what he's doing, okay? And I remind God frequently, I don't know what I'm doing, but he already knows that, so I'm reminding myself. And he's the builder of his church. I remind pastors of that. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And I've told pastors that you fit in the, you fit in the God's program for the church that you're pastoring. And remember that he is the builder of the church. I learned that many years ago, many, many years ago, about 60 years ago, I learned that lesson. That is that the church is his, not mine. He is the builder of his church. And he said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so he's the builder of his church. So we try to fit into his program, but he will do that. Okay. He will do that as we trust him. Uh, what is postmodernism? Postmodernism, modernism just flatly denies the Bible, denies the truth of it, uh, a lot like Albert Schweitzer, who makes statements like Jesus was a good but mistaken man who thought he was the son of God, and just a lot of people like that. But postmodernism goes beyond that, that what's truth for you is your truth. 
And the only uh, the only axiom of postmodernism seems to be this: the only absolute truth is the absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. <laughs> Say that for you again. The only absolute truth is the absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. Well, if there is no absolute truth, don't believe in the draw of gravity. Get up on the top of the church and down, jump off and see what happens. There is absolute truth. But basic postmodernism, what's right for me is right. Jesus and me have our own thing going. You know, what's right for my life is right. No, 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 no. What you believe is right for you. No, there is truth and there is absolute truth and it's written in this book. It comes from the God that created everything. This book works, folks. It's the most practical book in the whole world. When you preach this gospel and see people of every imaginable background changed in the name of Jesus Christ when they receive him as Savior, see people delivered from habits of a lifetime, see a lifetime transformed, set free by the power of Jesus Christ, to me that's still the greatest miracle. Still the greatest miracle. Lives are transformed. We can look out at our church every Sunday and see people from every imaginable background that Jesus Christ has set free by his power and by his amazing grace. And he, he still sets people free. That's the message we need to deliver to people. That doesn't matter what you've done. God loves you. He cares about you. He paid the bill for your sin. And if you start serving him, he'll change your life. He will forgive and forget your past. Never bring it up again. He will forget it. Many wouldn't be in Christ. They are a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. And God's able to keep you as long as you're willing to be kept, as long as you want to be kept. That doesn't mean you can go out and live like the devil. No, you can't do that. The Bible is very clear on that in the New Testament. Why does God give these warnings in the New Testament? Because it can't happen? Why does he bother giving the warnings if it can't happen? He gives warnings. He even calls them holy brothers, sharers of the heavenly calling in Hebrews. Beware lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in apostatizing from the living God. He gives that warning very clearly in the book of Hebrews, along with many others in the New Testament. But God will keep you if you're willing to be kept. And we need to let people know in this difficult hour that God is real. And it may be that he allowed this thing to come to try to call people home and try to get people to think about eternity and what's really important in life. What is important? Uh, what are the four minimal facts of the resurrection that are so strongly attested historically? that they're granted by nearly every scholar who studied the subject, even the skeptical ones. I don't know which particular four, four the questioner is asking for, but number one, the eyewitnesses. They, 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 they were so varied, they never backed down on it. Okay, we're told, in, we're told in 1 Corinthians that over 500 people saw him at one time. 500 people. And then secondly is the apostles. And there's a statement I read many years ago that is true. They did not try to explain the resurrection. The resurrection explained them. They were a bunch of cowards hiding in a room. Their hero, Jesus, the one they thought was the Messiah, had been crucified. He tried to tell them, but they wouldn't listen to them. And he's been crucified. Now some of the women are saying that they saw him. They couldn't be. They must, suddenly he appears in the room. And they go out from that upper room and turn the world upside down. That's what they said when they came to Thessalonica. Those that have turned the world upside down have come here also. They didn't try to explain the resurrection. The resurrection explained them. And then you have the persecutor and the murder of Christian Saul of Tarsus, who met Jesus on the Damascus Road, revolutionized his life. Instead of persecuted, he became Paul the Apostle. He went into Arabia for three years, read Galatians, and Jesus revealed the gospel to him in Arabia for three years. Then he went back and met with the apostles. Then he went back. But Jesus had revealed the gospel to him. You know, it's interesting when I talk about Bible prophecy, what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. This, that was the first letter written in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians. And Paul describes the same order of events that the book of Revelation brings out. The rapture of the church and then the beginning of the day of the Lord, the great tribulation period. Identical to what Revelation teaches. And the book of Revelation was the last book written. And then 1 Thessalonians was the first letter written. Okay, the Gospel of John hadn't been written yet. 
I'm not sure about Luke and the others. But probably the Gospel of Luke hadn't even been written yet. We don't know about Matthew and Mark. Okay, Mark was undoubtedly the first one written, but but we don't know about the others for sure. Okay, so the, the, the minimal facts, Saul of Tarsus. And then there's another statement, there are over 66,000 pieces, bits of literature outside the Bible that recognize that Jesus resurrected from the dead, that Jesus was alive. Did you know when Muhammad wrote the Quran 500 years later, he knew he couldn't deny that Jesus was seen after his crucifixion? He admits that Jesus was born of a virgin. By the way, he has a whole chapter about the Virgin Mary. He doesn't even tell you who his mother was. He, he mentioned several times in the Quran that Jesus was born of a virgin. But he, he teaches that someone else died in Jesus' place. Why? He knew he couldn't deny the fact that Jesus was seen after his crucifixion. And the fact, medical science, the things that happened on that cross, there's no doubt that he was dead. And no doubt that tomb was empty. Another fact is the Roman soldiers that were guarding that tomb, they said, well, his disciples came while well, we slept and stole him. Had that been true, the Roman soldiers would have been killed. They had been executed for letting the body get away, and they worked. That's another proof of the resurrection. The proof is overwhelming, folks. It's the best attested fact of ancient history. Best attested fact. You know, some people say there really wasn't a Jesus. Oh, yes, there was. He was, and he, he was born according to the scripture, and it is a best attested fact of history, okay? The same people don't doubt that, uh, you know, Homer, the Roman poet, lived. They don't, okay, they don't doubt that, even though it was somewhere between 700 and 1,000 B.C. They don't doubt that. They don't that doubt that Alexander the Great lived, 300 B.C. They don't they doubt that Socrates, okay, who was a teacher of Aristotle, who was a teacher of Alexander the Great, they don't doubt that they lived. They just... Why? Because the devil hates the name of Jesus. You notice Hollywood never says, oh, Confucius or old Buddha, always Jesus. Jesus' name is the one taken in vain by Hollywood. Okay? Always. Why? Because Satan is the god of this world. And there's one name under heaven given among men whereby people can be saved. That's the name of Jesus Christ. Why does the church say that God did not create evil when he himself claims that he did in Isaiah 45, 7, Lamentations 3, 38, and Amos 3, 8. But what is the evil he's talking about he creates? Okay, if you read Isaiah 45, 7, it's the Babylonians that are going to ultimately come and destroy Jerusalem. If you're, and I'm sorry, in Isaiah, it's the Assyrians who are going to come ultimately and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel Okay, and they're going to come, and only Jerusalem was spared. They, there's actually a whole lot of, as I mentioned earlier on the program, a whole lot of the cities of Judah were destroyed by Sennacherib. Jerusalem was spared because of Hezekiah, okay, and his faith, and the whole city was spared. But, 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 but it's because of the enemy coming, and he's going to destroy the northern kingdom. He's going to take them away captive. That's what they meant by the evil in this context. That's what he's talking about. When you get to Ezekiel, it's the Babylonians that he's talking about, both in Ezekiel and Lamentations. This evil is coming upon us. Yeah, what is it? Nebuchadnezzar. And that evil was the Babylonians that were going to destroy Jerusalem and carry them away captive. And God says, I'm creating this evil. Why? Because of your sin, because of your idolatry, because you've turned away from me. And that's what Amos says, too. That's just what Amos talks about. Okay, I'm going to take you out of my land. You know, I like what Amos and Hosea say. They, they're against the northern kingdom of Israel and idolatry. And some of the most expressive of the minor prophets, Amos and Hosea, uh, you're a baby too stupid to be born, he calls them. Okay, just a whole bunch of pictures like that. And, and they say our lovers give us our corn and our wine, meaning our idols. And God says, I'm going to show you who's giving your corn and wine. I'm going to kick you out of my land. Okay, because it's my land, not your land. And so the evil they're talking about is the enemy coming to destroy them and carry them away captive. Here's something else. I've heard for years that speaking in tongues is a language that the devil can't understand. 
if that's the case, when if someone speaks a tongue in another nation or third world country speaks tongues in, and it's English, that wouldn't, wouldn't the devil understand those languages? In Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, is the author talking about when we lose faith in God or we backslide him? Well, actually, there isn't anything in the Bible that teaches the devil doesn't understand you when you're speaking in tongues. I've heard people speak known languages. I mentioned before that when I was in the army, there was a, a little Korean girl about 10 years old, got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and about the only English the children knew was, G.I., give me some gum, G.I., give me some candy, because we were always giving it out to the little kids as we drove through the streets of Seoul and the small villages. We were always giving candy away, <laughs> and that's about the only English they knew. And I saw this little 10-year-old girl get baptized in the Holy Spirit in the church I was attending, and she used perfect English like you would use to write a doctoral dissertation. And she used words like omnipotent and omniscience, the all-seeing God and the all-powerful God, perfect English. And about all she knew was, G.I., give me some gum. G.I., give me some candy. I heard my mom speak in Latin. Heard my cousin ask her, Aunt Elsie, when did you learn Latin? And asked me, when did I learn it? And my mother had spoken language in a family gathering. First time we went to witness to our relatives in Canada. My parents, my mother was born in England. My dad was born in Canada. And they moved to Detroit three months before I was born. So I was the only American on both sides of the family. <laughs> And we went up to witness to our relatives after I met the Lord when I was 19. My grandmother's house was full. My mother started speaking in tongues. And I'd never given an interpretation before. And God gave me one sentence at a time to say in English. I've only been baptized in the Holy Spirit about a month before. And my cousin Bobby, I've mentioned this before, who was a couple years older than me, like a big brother, asked my mom, Aunt Elsie, when did you learn Latin? She said, Bobby, I only went through the eighth grade. I never learned Latin. He said, George, when did you learn it? I said, I didn't learn it. He said, well, I've been studying Latin five years. And Aunt Elsie spoke perfect Latin, and you spoke exactly in English what she said in Latin. And you think that didn't build my faith right away? No, there's nothing in the Bible that says the devil doesn't understand it when you're speaking in tongues. Now, there may be a language. Maybe God has a language we don't know. But, but I imagine usually it's a spoken language somewhere, but maybe not. It says, you know, Paul talks, oh, I speak with the tongues of men and angels. So we don't know a whole lot about tongues of angels, but we do know about tongues of men. And then the, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 4 through 6 says basically this. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, that's Jesus, were made sharers of the Holy Spirit, Tasted the word of God, good. And the powers of the world to come good and fell away to renew them again to repentance, saying they keep on crucifying the Son of God afresh and keep putting him to an open shame. He's talking there about the apostate, the person that no longer believes Jesus is the way of salvation. Those that crucified him were those that said he's a liar, he's a malefactor, he's the, he is not the Messiah. They called him a liar. So someone that's had faith in Jesus Christ and turns to something else away from Jesus is an apostate. And I, I read one book that said only Jews can do that by going back to Judaism. No, the whole Bible's for the whole body of Christ. And again, the Bible gives warning. The backslider's like the prodigal son. He started out at home. He still knew what it was to go back home. And I remind you, when he came home, the father said, this my son was dead. He's alive again. That's the backslider. But, but Hebrews chapter 6 is talking about the apostate, okay? Uh, I'm past my time. I apologize. I'm just going to take one more. How should a Christian deal with feelings of guilt regarding past sins? They're gone. You can't go back and change them. Don't let the devil beat you up with them. He's good about reminding you. What I've told congregations for years, the only one to remember your past sins is you and your friends and the devil and your friends and the devil are good at reminding you about them. And what about what about what about sins past salvation? Now that you're saved, yeah, you feel bad for it, but you can't go back and change it. Just ask God to help you be stronger the next time and learn to say no. Okay. Again, if you don't have a church home, you're in the Kansas City area. I do invite you to Sheffield Family Life Center. We have service at nine and eleven on Sunday. 
Wednesday night, we have the adult service and youth service going on. The youth are in the gym. And then on Sunday, we have 9 o'clock and 11. During the 9 o'clock service, we do have children's services, okay? And we do have the youth services going on, too. But we have the children's services during 9 o'clock. And you can bring your family. We do spacing. The children do spacing. We have a large auditorium, a large complex if you don't have a church home. If you do have a church home, you belong there Sunday, okay? And again, let me encourage you to be faithful to your church, to take people with you. Stop laying out a church more than you have to. I know a lot of people are concerned, a lot, but we're very careful, okay? And I'm sure every other church is very careful. And I've actually ministered in other churches and found they leave every other row empty. They leave seats in between unless you're a family group sitting together. And we do exactly the same thing. And, and we use the alternate rows for the second service that haven't been used. You wear your mask in and out because that's the city ordinance. Okay. And uh, we, we have good worship service. And, and my son will be preaching in both services Sunday. Now, tomorrow night, we have youth service and adults. And that's from 7 to 8.30. I'm going to start on 2 Peter tomorrow night. I'm only going to be in 2 Peter two or three weeks, and then I'm going into the Gospel of John. The Lord's been really making John pop out of my mind for some reason. He wants me to go through it again. I've had the privilege of teaching it in the college classroom, and, and I don't go into that kind of detail on Wednesday nights. But it's, uh, it's the most published book in history. You know, a lot of people... A lot of places where they carried the gospel back years ago, the very first thing they did was the gospel of John. They translated it in the language of the people, and they pass out the gospel of John. I understand Wycliffe is still doing that in many places, and it's the most it's the most copied book. It's written to Christians. Okay, it's written to Christians. Matthew wrote to the Jews, showing Jesus is the promised Messiah. Mark wrote to the Romans, who were interested in action. There's not much teaching in Mark. It shows him going straight away immediately from one mighty act to another. And then Luke is written to the Greeks because, the, I remind you, the gods of the Greeks were Paulus, Zeus, you know, glorified human beings. He shows Jesus as the last Adam, traces his family tree all the way back to Adam to show that he's the last Adam, the perfect man who didn't fail where our our first parents did, and he restores us back to God, what Adam lost. And then John's written to the Christian to show what the what, what the abundant life is like. And he shows the seven signs, as I've mentioned earlier. So I'm going to, I'm going to sign out. Let me mention again, and I apologize for my book on Revelation. Uh, this is the way I teach it in the college classroom. Okay. And I've, and I've written chapter 66. And the, the book of Revelation makes it very clear that the church will not be here during the Great Tribulation. You just follow the outline of the book of Revelation, and I've written it in simple English. I call it chapter 66. Why do I call it that? Because there's 66 books in the Bible, and Bible prophecies, it's like a skyrocket here, there, back and forth. If you doubt that, if you doubt that, read the book of Ezekiel, chapter 12, 13, and 14. It's about today, and that day Jerusalem will be a stone of stumbling rock of offense to all the nations of the world, but it bounces back and forth between things. Why? Because the prophets didn't see the time gaps. The book of Revelation puts it all together at the end of time. How's God going to close it? And I put Matthew 24 where it fits, Thessalonians where it fits, and I know the prophecies of Daniel where they fit into the story of the book of Revelation. I take Revelation a chapter at a time in simple English, so you can understand it. I explain Greek words and phrases that I'm using, okay? And it's available on eBay, Chapter 66 by George Westlake, W-E-S-T-L-A-K-E. -E. And it's actually eight and a half by 11 because the charts are big enough to read, okay? And it's 12-point print. It's not that little bitty print that I can't read at my age at 89. Okay, I try to make it so everybody can read it. And it's available on eBay. The price is $20, but then they charge for postage and also tax. But it's available for $20 on eBay. Chapter 66 by George Westlake. And I've written it simply. I call it the Revelation of Jesus Christ Simply Explained. And it is. I try to keep it simple. Because God intended us to understand the book of Revelation. And every symbol in the book of Revelation, if it's not explained in the book of Revelation itself, it's explained somewhere in the Bible. The Bible is the best interpreter of the Bible. 
And by the way, the book of Revelation is what's called apocalyptic or picture book. The book of Revelation is a picture book. The four main picture books in the Bible are Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, and Revelation. And again, every picture is explained somewhere in the Bible. And I have, you know, one little short part about how to understand apocalyptic literature, how to interpret it. Okay, it's called hermeneutics, how to interpret apocalyptic literature. Simple principles. Number one is the Bible is its own best interpreter, okay, because you can find the symbols explained in the Bible. And again, this chapter 66, how it's going to end. And the chronology of the book of Revelation is very important. The opening of the seven sealed book is the key to it. And it's a fascinating book to read, and it is understandable. Available on eBay, Chapter 66. I apologize for taking the time. I took an extra 10 minutes tonight because we had to be off last week because of the presidential debate. Only had less than a half hour last week. So please send your questions in ahead of time if you so choose to drgwwjr, drgwwjr at gmail.com. Stands for Dr. George W. Westlake, Jr. Now, before I close... If you don't know Jesus Christ, if you pray this simple prayer and mean it, Jesus Christ will meet you right where you are. I've seen many hundreds of people saved just praying this prayer. So if you need Jesus Christ, let me encourage you. Just close your eyes and pray this prayer and talk to Jesus. Dear Father, I ask you to forgive my sins in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I give you my life. I give you everything I am and everything I hope to be. Save me right now. Help me to understand your word. Help me to find a good Bible-believing church. Help me to tell others about your love. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you, and I'll find a good Bible-believing church wherever you live. There are churches that give people opportunity to receive Jesus Christ, that believe this Bible from cover to cover. May disagree in some other areas, but the important area is receiving Jesus Christ. God bless you. Have a great week in Jesus.